Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to New Zor Education. Uh, we continue talking about mathematical statistics, about foundations of mathematical statistics, just main principles, um, which is actually part of the course of advanced mathematics presented on unizor.com. I suggest you actually to watch this lecture from this website because there are notes on the site. Um, and generally the site provides some functionality, like you can enroll into the course, you can take exams, etc. All it requires is just your login name and that's it. Um, now, uh, this is uh, the lecture um, which should emphasize importance of the volume of data um, to do any kind of statistical analysis. Well, let me start with something which I have repeated a couple of times before, the purpose of mathematical statistics. Now, this is a subject which is supposed to, in conjunction with theory of probabilities, to serve the following purpose. For instance, you don't know anything about certain process, about the result of this process. It can be different. And you would like to predict um, what this process will, um, will be doing in the future. We can talk about weather forecasting or um, election forecasting, etc. So basically, the probability is a key to predict the future behavior of random variables. But if you don't know the probability, you need the previous steps, you have to gather the statistics and using the apparatus of mathematical statistics, evaluate your probabilistic characteristics of your um, random variable. And based on these probabilities, the distribution of probabilities uh, which you have um, derived from the statistical data, however imprecise it might be, you basically do some kind of conclusions about the future. So we have a lot about um, impreciseness in this particular case. First of all, statistical data do not give you an exact picture of the distribution of probabilities. In the best case, I case, it's approximation. Maybe better, maybe worse, but it's still an approximation. And then the probability, even not precise probability, gives you only the probable results of your experiments in the future, not concrete. So it's not really a, an exact science, so to speak, in this particular sense. But at the same time, we can always say that the future cannot be predicted with precise um, evaluation. It's always some kind of range of values, etc. So, with this presumption, let's just continue talking about um, mathematical statistics and the importance of the volume of data um, to have before you make any kind of conclusions about the probabilities. All right, so. Basically, what do we deal with? Let's consider, as before, we are dealing with discrete random variables, which might uh, take one of n different values with certain probabilities. So this basically describes our random variable. And what can we say about this particular random variable that we don't know anything about it? We don't know the values and we don't know the probabilities. I mean, it's great if it's given, but in all practical situations, it's not. Now, sometimes the values might be given. For instance, if you're tossing the coin, you do have only two values, heads and tails, and you can say that in this particular case, at least values are known. Now. If it's a perfect coin, then two probabilities which are corresponding to these two values are supposed to be one half and one half. But what if it's not a perfect coin? So let's just consider a situation when you would like to find out whether the coin is uh, ideal or not. So what do we do? Well, okay, so first of all, let's define a little bit more precisely, more mathematically what we're dealing with. So our random variable right now will contain uh, only two values, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to take only two values, and let's associate with heads the value of 1 and with uh, tails the value of 0. 
and we have two probabilities. Well, obviously P2 is 1 minus P1, so we don't have to evaluate P2, we have to evaluate only P1. And, I mean, we presume that if it's an ideal coin, P1 is supposed to be 1 half. But how can we prove it? Well, we toss the coin, right? Okay. So, um, let's think about the variation of the P1. Now, what's the definition of the probability? As we defined it, I mean, there are many different approaches to define the probability, but the way how I preferred to do it with discrete variables like these, I prefer to relate it to the limit of the frequency of occurrence of certain events. So, if we will toss the coin infinite amount of time, infinite number of times, then the number of uh, heads would actually be um, approaching whatever this particular probability is. I mean, for ideal coin, it would be one half. But that's an infinity, which means um, I have to actually um, make my experiment infinite number of times, which is, is impossible. And um, so what do we do? Well, we just do it certain finite number of times, right? All right, so, so what do we do is, let's consider that we are tossing the coin um, lowercase n uh, times. Now, each toss of the coin results in either head 1 or tail 0, right? So we have basically lowercase n uh, random variables. Now, why is it random variables? If we toss the coins n times, then I will have concrete values, right? But if we will toss it another n times, we will have different values, right? So basically my series of n experiments um, it, it can be conducted in either of two ways. Either you have one coin and you toss it n times. Or you have n coins and toss it once. So in both cases we can consider the cumulative result of either a series of n tossing of one coin or, uh, or one toss of n coins at the same time. We can consider the cumulative result as one result of one big cumulative experiment, right? So, as one experiment is conducted, we will have n values. If we will conduct another time this cumulative experiment, we will have other values. So, the combination of the series of these n values is one concrete example, one concrete result of one cumulative experiment. And based on these data, we would like to evaluate uh, our uh, probability P1. Now, how can it be done? Well, very simply, since uh, uh, tail is 1 and, uh, uh, and head is 0, some of these would be the number of times we have heads, right? And if we will divide it by n, new random variable eta represents actually the frequency of occurrence the head among n experiments. So, if my n tends to infinity, then this actually will go to the real probability p1. But for any finite number, any single value of eta, eta has one particular single value, uh, and we are trying somehow to say that, okay, it's probably close to p1. Well, now, let's consider just a little bit more uh, general problem. If you have a random variable and it has only two values, one or zero, and you have conducted one experiment, in this case it's a cumulative experiment, but anyway, we've got some value, right? Now, what's the probability of this particular value to be a good evaluation of the random variable itself? Well, it depends. There are different random variables and different distributions. If the distribution of our random variable is very narrow, let's say uh, a little bit more practical example. If you are measuring the length of the car with some kind of a ruler 
in centimeters and millimeters. Let's just put it this way. You measure it once and you will get some number. But if somebody else measure, even with the same ruler, in millimeters, the length of the car, most likely it will be a different result. Because the millimeter is such a small thing. So, basically, uh, one particular measurement does not really tell you the full picture about the distribution of the random variable. In this case, our lengths of the, uh, now measurements of the length of the car uh, are random variables. But it's supposed to evaluate something real, something concrete and constant, right? But in this particular case, the distribution of our random variables around this real value is probably very, very small. A couple of millimeters here and there, and considering the car is pretty long, I mean relative to a millimeter, our error is really mm, not, not very big. We can really say that any one single measurement, you don't have to really have 100 measurements and then average them and do whatever else. Even one single measurement is a good enough uh, approximation. Now, same thing here. We are measuring something real, the probability of our random variable to take value 1. Now, this is a something real which we don't know what it is. It's like length of the car. But this random variable, eta, really gives some kind of a measurement of this. And the quality of this measurement is probably, we are intuitively thinking, since this is a limit by definition of the values of this thing. So, intuitively we are thinking that eta should, uh, as, as n goes to infinity, should be more or less within very, very uh, narrow margin from the real value P1. So that's our intuitive understanding of this. And again, intuitively, it is obvious that the greater the n is, the more precise this evaluation is. Now, we will separately examine how precise it is. But basically, obviously, we do understand that we need some kind of quantitative measure of the quality of this evaluation. But at least intuitively, we all understand that the volume of the statistics which we need should be greater, and the greater it is, the closer uh, this eta would be, even single value of eta would be to P1, because we are saying that it should have a limit, and whenever the uh, n is increasing, that's exactly the direction our limit should go. So, can we evaluate P1 absolutely precisely? Definitely not. But what can be done about our evaluation and how can we quantify whatever actually is happening? Well, the best thing which we can say is that P1 can be in certain range around a single value of a random variable which we have obtained by conducting n experiments. Now, if we will conduct more than n, exper n, n experiments, let's say 10n or 100n, our evaluation should be better, which means p should be in a narrower margin around whatever the value we have obtained. So, if we have only like 10 experiments and we have some value of eta, we can say that p should be somewhere between eta minus delta let's say for 10 experiments this is an error for eta plus delta 10 but if it's a hundred it should be a hundred experiments and delta 100 should actually be smaller so this particular range would be smaller and p would be evaluated more precisely that's the idea but now can i say absolutely that with certain number uh, which, we have, which we have obtained as a result of our n experiments. And knowing n, we also, we also know precisely this particular margin, and we can say that something like this is actually true. So this would actually depend only on number of um, experiments. Well, no, let me confuse you a little bit more. Is it possible that all 
n times, I will get, uh, let's say, heads. The answer is yes, it is possible. It is very improbable, but not impossible. So the probability of having n experiments and n times we will have heads would be for ideal coin, one half to the nth degree. Because we have to have, for the first experiment should be uh, head, for the second should be head, etc., etc. Experiments are um, independent from each other, so the probability of the combined uh, event of every one of the n experiments to be a head is really the multiplication of them. Now, this is a very small number with relatively large n, right? For instance, n is 100. Is it possible to have 100 tossing of the coin and get 100 heads? Again, yes, it is possible. Very improbable, but not impossible. All right? That means that the value in this particular case, if I will have n times uh, head, it will be 1 and 1 and 1 n times. So it's n divided by n. It will be the value of eta would be 1 in this particular case. So the eta can be 1, with the probability, in ideal case, this. Now, what if n times in a row I will have tails? So I will have 0, 0, 0, 0, in which case eta would be equal to 0. So 1 and 0 are possible values. And if 1 and 0 are possible values, it actually gives us nothing in absolute terms about P1, because I know that P1 is a probability. It can be from 0 to 1, obviously. So we can have extreme values. Improbable, but not impossible. So this particular inequality cannot actually be uh, stated in absolute terms. I cannot definitely say that it will be something like... The only thing which I can definitely say is this. which doesn't mean anything at all, because it's the definition of the probability as a frequency, right? So that is an absolute term. As soon as I'm narrowing this interval from 0 to 1 to, let's say, uh, I know, for instance, for eta, I've got something 0 0.51, all right? So I can say that maybe it's less than 0, sorry, 0 0.51 minus 0 0.1, P1, 0.51, plus 0.1. Now, I would like to say something like this, but I cannot say it in absolute terms. What I can say is that since these are very improbable, and the greater n is, the less probable they are, so I can actually narrow with only certain probability. So there is always the probability of this thing. And the probability, let's say, is lowercase p. So my most important result is that I can derive some kind of a uh, probabilistic um, inequality as a variation of p1. Probabilistic in terms that I can say that p1 is from one to another value with certain probability. I can say that with a probability 1, which means in absolute terms, I can only say something like this. However, if my n is sufficiently large, and that's the point actually, then with a probability maybe not 1, but close to 1, I can narrow the particular um, range of the values. And if I'm satisfied with the probability, let's say 0 0.9, I can cut off all these results of the experiment which have the probability less than 0 0.1. So whatever is left will be 0 0.9. So again, I'm cutting off improbable results like these. And by cutting them off, I'm decreasing the, my certainty about this particular uh, inequality but maybe not significantly decreasing. Maybe certainty, like to be sure that something will happen of 90%, 0 0.9, is good enough for me. So that's the most important, basically, result of the statistics which you can do. 
that evaluation of certain probabilistic characteristic of the random variable is can, can, can be made within certain range with certain probability. If you want to increase the range, your certainty in your evaluation is greater, so the p would be closer to 1. If you want to narrow the range, then the probability of our p1 to be within this range would be smaller. And you have to really basically adjust your demands, how precisely and how certain you would like to be. Now, precision and certainty are kind of opposite things. The more precisely you would like to evaluate the, uh, uh, some, some characteristic, the probability, the less probable, less certain you are that your um, evaluation is, is, is correct. And the wider the range you agree with, then you, your, your probability would also be greater. So they're kind of going against each other. More certainty, you have to increase uh, the range, which means you have to decrease the precision of your evaluation. Uh, less certainty, then you can ma make your evaluation a little bit more uh, narrow. So what kind of three different um, entities we are dealing in statistics? That's very important, and this is kind of a result which I would like you to keep in mind. We have three major we have three major components in all this philosophy. We have the N, which is number of experiments, which is um, now we also have certain level of certainty which we would like to achieve. It's a probability of our evaluation to be correct. That's what it is. The probability of our evaluation to be correct. And we have certain range. Or sometimes it's expressed as either from A to B or from some um, in the middle to the left and to the right. In which case M is A plus B divided by 2 and delta is half of the B minus A divided by 2. doesn't really matter. Both are equivalent. So the range, the certainty, and the volume. Let me write it. Volume of experiment, number of times, certainty, and the range. So we have three major components in, in, in this science, if you wish. And they are interrelated. For instance, if you fix certainty and uh, which means let's say you would like to to be able to evaluate with a probability of 0 0.9 and you fix the range so you would like to evaluate your uh, let's say probability in this particular case uh, within the range of uh, from uh, within the range of one tenth for instance all right then you can find out what exactly the number of experiments you need or, alternatively, if you have the number of experiments and you have certain cert certainty you would like to be um, adhered to, you would like your conclusions to be certain at certain percentage point, then it defines your range, or if you wish, your delta, your margin of error. Or, if the volume is defined and margin of error is defined, then you can calculate your certainty. So basically what I would like to say is there is some kind of a functional dependency between n, p, and let's say delta, which is margin of error. This functional dependency exists. Let's say function is equal to zero, whatever the function is, doesn't really matter. And knowing two elements allows you to define the third one. If you know number of uh, number of experiments and the uh, and the certainty level which you would like to achieve, that dictates how wide your margin of error is. If you have defined, let's say, number of experiments and margin of error, then your certainty goes to a certain uh, way. Or if you would like your margin of error to be such and such, and you would like your certainty to be such and such, 
that dictates what number of experiments you have to provide. So the math mathematical statistics actually solves these three, three major problems. The maximum, again, what, what mathematical statistics can achieve is the following that certain parameter which they are evaluating is, is within certain range with certain um, uh, level of certainty expressed as probability of truth. And number of experiments is actually involved in, in, all, in all these things. That's the purpose of mathematical statistics in the more concrete terms. Not just to evaluate the probability, this is a very general um, uh, purpose, but this is a more concrete purpose. Actually, there are three more concrete purposes. Knowing n and p to define delta, knowing n and delta to define p, and knowing p and delta to define n. So one of these three problems is supposed to be solved if you would like to, um, to deal with mathematical statistics. Now, this particular um, this particular um, expression that our uh, parameter is within certain range with certain probability is a key point to understand the mathematical statistics. It's not absolute and it's always, res it's always related to certain level of certainty which we can make our conclusions. Well, that was it and that probably would conclude my introductory part to mathematical statistics. Um, I would like actually to, to, to read the notes for this lecture. It's presented on unizor.com again and that would probably, I mean something I explain maybe slightly differently in, in the notes than during the lecture. So you will just be more familiar with the whole approach how it is. Um, Alright, that's it for today. Thank you very much and good luck.